Good morning from lovely central Pennsylvania. I am Tom Moore here with Tony Gerdeman. This is your Buckeye Huddle pregame show for Ohio State versus Penn State. We're doing it from our, the safety, security, Wi-Fi reliability of our hotel room this morning uh, due to some of the uncertainties, the vagaries of road games, especially road games at Penn State. Tony, I'm excited to get to Beaver Stadium, but even more excited to be doing this in the place that we know we can actually get yeah. an entire show out and done and to the people. Well, I think, do you remember when Terrell Pryor, what he said about Penn State? Tony, did he say it with two country? I think he was talking about the Wi-Fi. He may have been talking about the Wi-Fi. Especially 2008 Wi-Fi was not great not anywhere, great. especially Central Pennsylvania. It's actually still 2008 in Central Pennsylvania. Oh, not Tom. many people know that. Send the letters to Tom. See, I sent because her... they don't email. They only send letters. <laughs> See, or I said earlier in the week that this was like a, I would I would completely consider moving to State College. Like it would be high <laughs> on my list of places in the Big Ten. I don't mind 2008. It was it was a good year for me. Not not globally, but 2008 was a fine year for me personally. Enough so. politics, Tom. <laughs> It's more of an economic <laughs> statement, but that's all right. Uh, boy, we're three minutes in and everyone's already angry. Great job, Tony. Great. Guess what, Tony? People are going to be angry. Speaking of people being angry, let's do the availability report. Ohio State uh, just released it right at the top of the hour, nine o'clock. Uh, Tony, yeah. uh, you remember when uh, Bart opens the closet to see uh, Principal Skinner and Mrs. Krabappel in the closet and says, set your faces to stun? <laughs> Tony. Jackson Smith and Jigba is not available today. What a surprise. Surpri was it surprise, surprise, surprise? Yes. No, this is not a surprise, Tom. I'm sorry. You, you, I am not stunned. I kind of expected this. Maybe, I'm the only one, though. Maybe his pitch count is zero this week. Is it really a count if there's no count? But again, we shouldn't be making light of this because now people are even angrier that Ohio State is without their star receiver once again. And it calls into question, as I've seen on the message board, should he have been playing at all? Which is the same thing that was asked in the Toledo game, after the Toledo game, and Ryan Day said, yeah, he was good to go, so why wouldn't we play him? And I'm assuming the same thing happened here. I mean, he played, what, 20-ish snaps and looked fine until the last one. Yeah, and then kind of limped off the field and, you know, watching it live, it was like, mm, that didn't look. Right. And then watching it later again on TV, it was like, mm, that really didn't look right. That did not look like a pitch count issue. And uh, I mean, listen, we can we can get an, an explanation from Ryan Day after the game. And, and you know, I mean, possibly something has changed between then and now. And this it is this is a news is reflective of that. But I think it's a possibility that he has, in fact, been injured this entire time. So uh, he will not be there. I feel like we almost don't need to explain how uh, <laughs> this future first round draft pick, what the loss of this future first round draft pick will mean for the Ohio State offense today, because it has just been like gestures vaguely towards the rest of the season. Yeah. It, this, I mean, this is this, what they have been doing yeah. all year. And so you know who's going to play. They have three other extremely capable, viable wide receivers who have been doing a fantastic job this season. So as long as those three guys stay healthy, you know, we have talked all week about. Penn State having two good corners and one good safety, and you know maybe they'll be able to match those guys up, and then this becomes the Cade Stover game or something like that. Well, I mean, this is only ever going to be three receivers on the field at a time, mm -hmm. so it's not like oh now they can't go four wide. That's they they don't do that anyway. So you've got the three very good receivers out there scoring touchdowns every week. I don't expect them to suddenly not score touchdowns this week, and you know it's one of these things where you only notice. Jackson Smith and Jigba is missing when he tries to play, mm -hmm. which is crazy to say. Which is crazy to say. And, you know, we, we talked about the fact that before the season, he was someone who was potentially going to completely have rewritten the Ohio State record books yeah. and yet never have been the best wide receiver on a team that he played on. And, <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I think that is probably remaining true this year, which is a testament to uh, Brian Hartline's wide receiver room and the insane depth in there. Yeah. Uh, a couple other names of note. I mean, we'll, we can read through the whole list, but a lot, there's a lot of names that have been on here on an awful lot this season. A couple other names of note, however, uh, Court Williams, of course, still out. He was out last week. Um, Bradley Robinson, the long snapper. Um, he appeared to suffer a knee injury last uh, week covering a punt, I believe. And, um, you know, I, I don't know that we've got a final, final verdict on him, but 
you know, he is, well, he, first of all, he's someone who's been with Ohio state forever and has just been the absolute picture of reliability mm-hmm. for them as a long snapper, which is the highest praise you can give a long snapper is you never really noticed him unless he was down, downing a punt or something like that uh, with him out. It's going to be Mason Arnold uh, stepping in fun fact about Mason Arnold that I picked up. Uh, I don't know if this is public knowledge, but he uh, is uh, his family is neighbors with Derek Jeter, where he is from, which is an, an interesting uh, an interesting neighbor to have. That was something I yeah. heard at one point. So uh, he is number ninety four in your program and will be number one on your long snapper depth chart. So that's one of those things where if you don't you know you just hear Mason Arnold's name once at the beginning of the broadcast, then Mason Arnold had a great day. Um, you know, I it, don't even know if you'll hear his name unless. The, the folks doing the game are doing a deep dive mm-hmm. in terms of just something to watch. Yeah. You know, long yeah. snapper Bradley Robinson is out. He's been the long snapper for years now. And picture of consistency, mm-hmm. something to keep in mind. Uh, yeah. I, I thought, um, at least watching the game live last week, Mason Arnold did a fine job. I didn't go back and critique the snaps after the fact when I was, when we did our rewatch. You, you almost don't need to because no. if you didn't notice them, they were fine. And so what's the problem? Yeah, yeah, and it, but it is one of these things where I'm sure a lot of people are, are like, "Who's Bradley Robinson?" <laughs> and that's just that's the life of the long snapper, basically. Exactly. Yeah, he is. Uh, you know, he he is also just one of the nicest, yep. nicest guys. And we we almost never get to talk to the long snappers. And when we do, it's always like a surprisingly interesting conversation. He's just a very very interesting and very intelligent guy. So hopefully, he is able to make a full recovery. And you know, Mason Arnold, Mason Arnold's congratulations, next next man up there. Um, I'll just run down the whole list here. Uh, Amari Abor, defensive end, freshman, he's been out for a while. Cameron Babb has been out all season. Cameron Brown, we knew Cameron Brown was going to be out. Well, we more or less knew Cameron Brown was going to be out this week. Ryan Day said wasn't going to be a long term thing. So to me, that suggests maybe next week possibly the week after so see how practice goes yeah this yeah week. it was not it was not necessarily something where we expecting we we're expecting to see him back this week so it will probably be it'll be interesting to see denzel burke on one side is that jordan hancock on the other side is that jk johnson on the other side uh we can take a little deeper dive on that later freshman wide receiver caleb burton uh walk on running back tc caffey he's out that's why you have um, Chip Trainum. Chip Trainum there at running back now. Corbin Cleveland, Lloyd McFarquhar, Mitchell Melton, Taraja Mitchell, Jalen Pace, Evan Pryor, uh, Joe Royer, the other names on there. Most of those guys have been out a big chunk of the year, if not the whole year. So Has Caleb Burton been on the list, or has he just been on my mental list? He has not been on these lists, but he also is the one freshman wide receiver who you just you really haven't seen. Yeah. And... You know, you've seen uh, you see Kojo Entry out there sometimes on special teams. You see Caleb Brown out there sometimes on you special see teams. Grace play a little bit. Caleb Brown got a catch yeah. last week. Like yeah. those three were clearly ahead of him. Yeah, yeah, it, and it it has all fall. It has been like sometimes there's just the guy who's just you don't hear mm. anything about him, and it's you kind of go, huh? And he's been one of those guys, I think, this fall. Yeah, yeah. When asked about the freshman receivers, Friday Day said, "You know, they're they're working. Basically, it's like don't expect don't expect a Garrett Wilson, don't expect a Jackson Smith and Jig, but don't expect a Chris Olave to like rise in November." Is is the way I took it. One name that's not on this list is Jaden Ballard, who left the game limping last week. So I think that's significant that he's not on there. Although Tom, as we know. Just because you're not listed on this list, and there are no game time decisions, mm-hmm. but just because you're not on this list doesn't mean that you won't wake up Saturday morning with something that happened. Yeah, and we have we have seen names. especially Halloween. Yes, that is true. Yes, just sure. <laughs> too much too much sugar last night. <laughs> Questionable stomach. Yeah, yeah. It, it it feels like we've seen guys not on the list magically suddenly not be able to play. We've seen guys on the list or, you know, on game time decision and just be able to play. And so it, it's, you know, the, this, these are always a little bit, take it with a grain of salt, but, you know, I, I feel like we've talked the Jackson Smith and Jigba thing a little bit. Let's talk a little about Cam Brown, yeah. because this is not the most dynamic offense that Ohio state will face this fall. 
But given the wide, given the offensive line issues that Penn State has, and given the young running backs who have not been able to consistently, you haven't had the you know the five, six, seven, eight yard chunks consistently out of those running backs. It's just been a lot of ones and twos, and you know, and minus one, and then a three, and then a sixty-five, but then a two and a three. It feels like they're going to have to move the ball through the air if they're going to move the ball through the if, you know if they're going to move the ball kind of consistently down the field. You're going to do it in 10, 12 yard chunks. You're going to have to do it through the air. You know, everyone immediately is saying, "Well, yeah, but Sean Clifford's not very good." The Penn State wide receivers are good. They're they're okay. They're good, but they're not Ohio State good. How big is it to not have Cam Brown on Saturday? I don't know that it's all that big. Because you have Jordan Hancock back for a second week. You've got J.K. Johnson. You've got Denzel Burke. So you've got three guys that you like. One of the things that uh, Jim Knowles said this week about Jordan Hancock is he's good with the ball up in the air. Like he He's good with the 50-50 stuff. He's strong. He's long. Same with J.K. Johnson. This is um, maybe a uh, – you know not, not a good thing that Cam Brown is out, but they're going to make the most of it. I think they're going to make the most of it. This this 2021 class of corners with Denzel Berg, Jordan Hancock, J.K. Johnson, I feel like they're ready to, the three of them, just surge up. And we've talked about this what, last week, before or after the game, when Cam Brown comes back, I don't know that he has a job, like a starting job. Now he may be in that rotation. I just And maybe this week decides a lot of that, how well they play how well they don't play. Thank God Cam Brown is back. Or Cam, we're going to try to get you worked in there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's I think this game will have a, a say have a say about that. Well, and as much time as Jordan Hancock has missed, this is a real opportunity for some extra snaps where, you know, they would obviously yeah. prefer to have Cam Brown there as an option as well. But if he's not, well, okay, now this is an opportunity for whether Jordan Hancock is the second guy and he's out there starting or the third guy and he's the first guy off the bench, either way, it's more snaps for him. So with as much ground as he's, you know, he's still trying to knock the rust off a little bit after missing pretty much all of fall yep. camp and then the first, what, six games of the year, then, you know, that that's a really big thing for them to potentially get him back. That's why I don't think it's a bad thing that Cam Brown is out because it helps Jordan Hancock. Mm-hmm. And I think they want him to be – part of this defense. And so this helps that along. Yeah. This helps the later 2022 yes. uh, Ohio state team. It unquestionably helps the 2023 Ohio state team who is, you know, unless, unless there's so, someone makes a, uh, makes an exit from the program, which I don't wouldn't anticipate with these three guys being in line to be the guys next year, the Burke Hancock, JK Johnson group. If those three guys are playing the way they are and you add another year and you, you I mean, that's a pretty good corner room next year. And, you know, I guess more importantly, you're going to start be, you know, start playing better offenses. Now this yeah. is going to be the best offense they've played all season. You've got Michigan on coming up. You're going to play someone in Indianapolis. And then you're playing presumably someone, if things, unless things go wrong, you're playing someone who's going to have a better offense in the college football playoff and potentially twice in the college football playoff. It, so yeah, this is, this is when you need to start getting those guys back and healthy. It would be fun talking about them next year. If they finish strong, where do they rate among the Ohio State cornerback trios mm-hmm. of the past decade? And when you've got like a, a, a Denzel Ward, Jeff Okuda, David Arnett, um, or no, it was Gary on Conley, Marshawn Lattimore, and Denzel Ward in like 2016. 16, yeah. And Okuda showed up in 17. Yeah, it's, you know, th- this is not a great thing for necessarily for Ohio State today but in the short medium and long term this is probably ultimately a beneficial thing for them but obviously they would like to get cam brown back when they can because how many snaps does jordan hancock get if cam brown is getting 40 (laughs) probably uh 30 to 40 fewer than he is on yeah uh, yeah, gonna gonna get now so yeah that that's gonna be definitely something to watch and you know penn state's got good wide receivers and they have a, a good quarterback and people, you know, I can already hear people rolling their eyes when I say that he's a good quarterback, but he's, he is a yeah. perfectly serviceable, Look solid big 10 quarterback. Sean Clifford has been there. You, you do not get to be a multi-year starter without being a good quarterback. If you're on a team that's winning eight, nine, 10 games every year. 
Ohio State fans saw a bad quarterback last week. Do. And so there's um, – compare that. And mm -hmm. Sean Clifford isn't perfect. C.J. Stroud's not perfect. C.J. Mm -hmm. Stroud has thrown more interceptions than Sean Clifford this year. So, Tom, you tell me who's better. Don't. I'll probably still C.J. Stroud. Oh, God, God. Okay. Yeah. Um, so th that's going to be an interesting thing to watch. But to me, ultimately, I think the thing that is going to – make or break the day for Penn State on offense is that offensive line. Mm -hmm. And it has seemed to me that since the Sandusky sanctions came down and they lost 20 scholarships for multiple years, we, you always see and you always hear the place that you actually see that is along those lines, offensive line, defensive line. When you lose all those scholarships, you're not, you know, it's, you're not losing them all from one spot. It's just, there's less depth everywhere. But where it sh really shows up is along the lines, and that that killed Penn State. I mean, Ohio Penn State in those like those Bill O'Brien years, they lost to Ohio University at one point. They lost to Temple at one point. They and they gave up a million sacks in that Temple game. And you saw the same thing sort of for USC in the wake of the Reggie Bush yeah. sanctions. Same thing. You, you see it along the lines. But they haven't ever gotten back up to what they were before, which is been super weird to me it, it is weird i think the recruiting i think is okay it's up there with anybody else in the big 10 on the lines because they've got a, a good area but the development has been lacking you know you, you hear names that the names are familiar because you see them in recruiting and a, a lot of these guys are guys that ohio state missed on and you know other schools florida missed on them florida state missed on them and it's like you watch them play and well, it's like, I don't I don't think they missed. I think they dodged bullets at this point. But uh, I think there's some developmental issues at Penn State along the line, and, and you know that that's uh, that spans multiple coaches, mm -hmm. and um, it's not just numbers at this point. Yeah, and you know you go back through Penn State's history on the line, and you I mean the names that Ohio State fans will absolutely remember from recruiting, Rasheed Walker tackle out of Maryland, right? Yeah. And was a Ohio State, Penn State decision right up to the last minute and ended up going to Penn State and just and had it just kind of like a meh kind of career. Uh, Landon Tengwall, true freshman starting at guard this year for Penn State. He's been kind of banged up. I don't remember if he played. He was questionable before that Minnesota game, and I don't remember if he played last week or not. But, you know, another name that was – he was a very highly rated player. He, I remember him visiting Ohio State and ended up going to Penn State – Starting as a freshman, which is, you know, that's that's both good and bad. That's right. good for him, but it's also, well, you don't have anyone who can beat out a, tr a true freshman. A true freshman starting for you is generally not a great sign. No, we saw Michael Jordan do that for Ohio State, beat out a number of other guys who showed then later on in their career they couldn't really play at Ohio State either or shouldn't have been playing at Ohio State when they finally got their opportunities. But you know, Steven Gonzalez is another name. Mm -hmm. Yep, Jersey City. Yep. A guard that uh, – a three-star guy, but a lot of people wanted Penn State mm -hmm. ended up with. Don't know that he ever was all that great. And, and Ohio State does uh, actually win some of these as well because Penn State right. was in on Dewan Jones. They, it was Ohio State and Penn State were two of the ones that were really pursuing Dewan Jones very late in that cycle. Isaiah Prince. Isaiah Prince, yep. Um, but yeah, Dewan Jones was Dewan Jones was one of those where the early signing they passed, and he was kind of like a name you had just sort of heard, and then he became the hottest yep. commodity in the world. And you know, he had he has he was not nearly as highly ranked as Rasheed Walker. He's turned out to have a much better career than Rasheed Walker. You know, and and then you start wondering, is it just you know? I don't know that we have a big enough sample size to really determine, but you wonder, is it the guy? Is it? the program, the development, the coaching, whatever it is. So, it is. Yes. It's all of that. Yeah. It, it probably, it probably is all of that. Yes. So, you know, how much will that Penn state offensive line hold them back? Cause I don't think, I mean, do you think that Penn state, you know, you'll, you'll see a, a final rushing yardage per carry total. And sometimes those are really skewed where it's, you know, on, on, 15 of your 16 carries, you average three yards, and then you have one 60 yarder, and that skews it to, and then it's like, oh, 4.8 yards per carry. That's not bad. You know, take out the the biggest one run for each of Penn State's guys. Do either of them get to four yards a carry against Ohio State? If you take out, you know, take out whatever their longest run is. Right. Uh, I, I think they're right, right there. I'm thinking, you know, three eight, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's a good one. That's a tough one because. Four is – it's not good. I mean, it's – and it's not It's not enough. It's mm 
Like you're still moving, but it, that still leaves you with third and whatever, because that, that those aren't all first down carries, mm-hmm. you know, that can leave you with the third and six. So you want more than four, like in co- four in the NFL is one thing. Five in co- five in college is almost not enough. Like it's, it's fine, but you'd still prefer more because you see six, seven yards per carry in college football, like a, mm-hmm. the good one. So if they're at, at four, um, that won't surprise me. I, I think it's going to be tough for them to run. Yeah, and I feel like five on average. And again, you take out take out the biggest run, so you avoid this sort of skewing it with the yeah. one big play. If you're at five, you know that's as many sixes as you get fours, yeah. and all of those are kind of keeping you on schedule. Yeah. You, it gets you to second and six. It gets you to third and two, and you're you're on schedule. You have your whole arsenal available to you on any of those plays. It's when it's second and eight third and seven that's when it's like well this is a passing down yeah. and that's when you get predictable and the same offensive line that's not opening holes in the run game now has to face a pass rush that's going hey this guy's about to pass so we don't have to really worry about rushing with you know you got to maintain the pocket you don't want to overrun the play all that kind of stuff but you don't have to run with quite the same level of discipline as you do if it's a could be a run could be a pass kind of situation well and Ohio State's pass rush and non-obvious passing downs, and I forgot to look at, at it this week, but of their 14 sacks before last week, seven of them were by the defensive line in non-obvious situations compared to Michigan's where they still only have two defensive line sacks in uh, non-obvious passing situations. So it's like a first and 10, first down pass is a non-obvious situation. And Ohio State, the pass rush does well then as well. So now – like you're going to telegraph something that's just going to make life even more difficult. That Those are the ones where they try to probably get the ball out quickly. Mm-hmm. Do you know what Penn State's yard per carry was last year? Penn State's yards per carry against Ohio State last or year. Or just overall? In the game. In, in, in the Penn State. Up, not taking the top one out or anything like that. I'm going to say it was – I feel like it was not very much. I'm going to say – 3.2. I'd say about like 2.0. 1.14. 29 carries for 33 yards. 29 carries for 33 yards. Tony, I don't know a lot about football. Is that good? That, I mean, it's over one. That seems like right. it's good, right? If you if you don't think about it as yards and you think about it as feet, now you're talking nearly you're like four feet a mm-hmm. carry. That's We were just saying four. Mm-hmm. That's, that can help move the chains. Uh, but no, still not very good. And uh, – can they triple that this year? And is that even enough? Well, yeah, tri- tripling that is still not great. Yeah, it, it just that to me, I you know, we've talked about this a bunch this week, but it just everything about this seems to me like Penn State's not going to be able to move the ball with extended drives. They're going to have to hit big plays, and when you hit those big plays, it has to not be. Wow, a 46-yard pass where you get tackled on the 23, and then you stall out three plays later and kick a field goal from 37 yards out. You know, you Penn State, if Penn State is not hitting big plays, this could get out of hand. If Penn State is hitting big plays and they're not converting those into touchdowns, this could get kind of out of hand. I, I feel like you have to see a long touchdown in both halves from Penn State. And then, or at least a long play that sets up a touchdown, both halves from Penn State. And then they really need to play good defense to keep Ohio State, to to have a chance in this one. The Ohio State defense at this point, they have not played any offenses. We know that. Correct. But have they given you reason to think that they aren't very good at this point? Because for me, I feel like they're going to play well. And yes, they haven't played anybody, but everything we've seen, has indicated that they should be able to contain this offense. And I'm, I'm wondering, do you have more confidence in this Ohio State defense or in Ohio State's ability to run the ball tomorrow, today? I think I have more confidence in Ohio State's defense. And, you know, I think you, you do need to caveat this with – Ohio State has really not played any good offenses. Like, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yes. They, they, have done too, they have done too bad offenses what a good defense would do to good offenses. You still haven't seen them play good offense. This is going to be the best rushing offense, the best passing offense, and the best scoring offense they've played at all this year. And 
this might be the best of all of those things that they play until the Saturday after Thanksgiving. So, you know, you're going to, you're going to take, you're going to have to take this evidence uh, and <laughs> learn what we can from it. But I, I feel like I know what I'm going to see later on today. And it ends with, you know, the, the final score ends with dash 17 for Penn state. It just, it, it, I just don't see them unless they get a couple big plays on defense or you know, kickoff right. return for a touchdown or block a punt or something like that. I kickoff just, return for a touchdown at Penn state. Are you serious? I don't, I don't think, I don't. I don't think we'll see that from the Nittany Lions. We never see that. The, the confidence in the defense is so strange that, or maybe the lack of confidence in the running game, or maybe it's not a lack of confidence in in really anything. It's just I'm surprised that I I am more. Uh, I feel like I know more about the defense than the running game when we've seen the running game have success. But it just takes one one game to be like, oh. Oh, but I also don't think they're nearly that bad. No, I, you're you're going to see a better Ohio State run yeah. game, and we're gonna we're gonna talk more about the uh, Ohio State offense uh, in the in the bottom half of the hour here. Right now, we're getting getting down towards nine thirty a.m. So we're gonna we'll at nine thirty we're gonna kind of re up the uh, availability report. We'll run through that again, and then we're gonna talk about the Ohio State offense after that. But uh, before that, I do want to get to uh, a good segment from our buddy Ross Fulton. He's uh, one of our X's and O's gurus at BuckeyeHuddle.com. He and Justin Whitlatch and Devin Radcliffe just do a fantastic job on that kind of stuff, just making you a smarter football fan. Uh, if you have not gone and listened to the Friday morning episode of Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning, no, Thursday morning episode of Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning. Sorry, it's been a long week. <laughs> it's always a guessing game. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the was. one with Ross. I, put, I and, and Ross is respected enough that I make the title Ross Fulton colon – and it was like Ross Fulton colon Ohio State versus Penn State preview. I just it's just like I can come up with a cutesy title, or I can just say, listen to Ross Fulton talk about football because he's smart. So here is sort of an abbreviated version from Ross of what he's expecting for this weekend. But you know, after the pregame show's over, do check out that uh, morning sco- uh, the morning show episode uh, with Ross as well. So uh, here is here is Ross's thoughts on today's game. The last few seasons, Ohio State and Penn State have played what is tended to be fairly close relatively low scoring games, at least by Ohio State standards. But what's different this year is that uh, Brett Pry, who was the Penn State defensive coordinator, is no longer there. And in his place is Manny Diaz. And, and Diaz takes a very different approach to Pry and, you know, very different to the to, uh, very sound Iowa defense Ohio State faced this season or th- this past week. He is willing to be unsound and you know not fit gaps or leave things open in exchange for trying to create negative plays uh, Michigan really exploited that uh, in Ann Arbor you know particularly with uh, gap or schemes where they pulled one or two guys to the other side of the line because Penn State could not adjust and fit the gaps correctly or, or Penn State would slant too far upfield leaving openings uh, and so the, the upshot has been Penn State has not been a very good run defense this year they've actually been statistically better against the pass but that should provide opportunities for Ohio State to get their run game back on track. Again, this will somewhat come down to, you know, continue to diversify the run game using plays like wineback or pin and pull where you're pulling uh, guys to one side and not being overly reliant on stretch. Uh, again, you know, in the passing game, Penn State will um, assuredly try to pressure C.J. Stroud. Diaz really likes uh, zone blitzes, so, you know, he'll bring five guys and play two deep and four under behind it trying to create sacks, you know, they'll rush very far upfield, which gives the quarterback opportunities to step up in the pocket. Again, for Ohio State, it's paramount that they protect Stroud, even if that's using more bodies and protection, because, you know, when Stroud has a, has a clean pocket and his receivers have time to get open, they, they make plays. Uh, you know, so Penn State, again, you know, relatively speaking to what Ohio State's faced this year, I'm sure we'll have some success defensively, but I don't think that Ohio State's facing a defense of Iowa's caliber, for instance. Um, the Penn State offense is the best offense that Ohio State has faced this season. Now, that might be a, a relatively low bar, but they, they are competent. And, and Sean Clifford has played for like 10 years now and can make a bunch of play, you know, can make some plays, particularly out of structure and, and with his legs. Um, so, you know, again, Penn State's problem the last few years has been their offensive line has been really poor. Uh, they do have a good left tackle this season, but the remainder of the line continues to have their struggles. And so, you know, they have young backs who are talented when they get to the second level, but they'll end up with a bunch of like one and two yard runs, uh, you know, duos, their preferred run play. But 
you know, they kept trying to do that early against Michigan with little success. And Ohio State's defensive line should be able to control the action. I think the question becomes, you know, Ohio State really has not been tested in the secondary. And even against Iowa, you saw some breakdowns in terms of passing off receivers that, that left some openings. But quarterbacks haven't been able to get to those busts because Ohio State's put so much pressure on them up front. And so it'll be incumbent upon Jim Knowles to continue to do that and, you know, I think we'll have to continue to watch uh, the corner situation as it evolves. I think Denzel Burke is playing better, and Ohio State's safeties are very good, but it will certainly be a new test. So, you know, I do think Penn State will have some success moving the football, but I think it'll be uh, spotty and inconsistent. And, uh, you know, I, I do think that Ohio State, even though they've played relatively weak offenses, should um, demonstrate why, statistically at least, they're, they're moving up the advanced rankings. All right. Thank you to Ross for that. Always love listening to Ross talk football. He uh, provides good, provides some uh, really different, you know, a little different kind of insights, especially his weekly articles at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Always, he's always got gifts in there and and videos. And uh, Kevin does a great job putting those together and and you know get it, make you know putting the whole thing together. It is a fantastic, really really insightful. Uh, package of stuff and you learn a lot so uh i mainly just like ross for his voice and so what i will do is i will call him up and just have him read his stuff to me <laughs> i don't like, actually read it it's like a book on tape but right. yeah yeah that's smart and it's just like i'll call ross up because again he's three hours away so i call him up at bedtime like ross just read it to me and i fall asleep to ross's voice it's very nice ross should start a 900 number for just five not five dollars a minute 5.99 a minute ross will don't tell him i fall asleep during it like he <laughs> thinks i'm i'm awake i'm just not, I'm not responding that's the way people like it ross's uh ross's uh podcast episodes typically not gonna make you fall asleep uh great i good, didn't mean to apply <laughs> that anyway so speaking of transitions right towards the end there ross mentioned you know the uncertainty at corner for ohio state Let's talk a little bit about that availability report. We're kind of at the bottom of the hour right now, so let's kind of reset things with with that. One of the names on that availability report, definitely not a shock here. Uh, Cornerback Cam Brown not going to play on Saturday against Penn State. This is, you know, we talked earlier, this is, it's not ideal, but with Jordan Hancock back, you have Denzel Burke healthy and, you know, maybe looking a little better. And you've got J.K. Johnson, who's just been very solid all year and continues to sort of grow in his role. It feels like Ohio State should be okay at corner, even without Cam Brown on Saturday. Yeah, think back to last year and past years when Cam Brown's name would be on the availability report. And without him, they would have to rely on Ryan Watts or Legend Cavazos or Seven Banks. And so now you don't have him and you have uh, Jordan Hancock, Denzel Burke, J.K. Johnson. I mean, even, even Jair Brown is – more reliable than like a legend Cavazo or Ryan Watts last year, mm-hmm. you know, like, um, and, he, and he got a start this year because of the, all of the absences, but they're deeper this year. We knew that going in. Um, don't have, didn't have as many guys, mm-hmm. but they're deeper in terms of quality. Cause remember last year, you've got like Demario McCall is one of the, the top five or so. And again, Watts and Cavazos who are no longer here. Uh, uh, just the depth is better than the talent is better. Mm-hmm. And I think that's maybe the most important thing. Yeah. The depth is better. The talent is better. The results are better. And you know, th- there's, there's a lot that goes into yeah. the results are better, but the quality of the players there is certainly one of those things. Uh, another place where Ohio state is very deep and going to have to test that depth. Once again, today, Tony, the wide receiver room, Jackson Smith and Jigba not going to play today. This is just, this feels like this is almost on the, like, why is this news kind of list? Like he's just, he, he has been on the field for, I think he, did he make it out of the first quarter against Michigan, against Notre Dame? He might've barely made it in barely the second maybe. quarter and then played a little bit against Toledo, played a little bit again last week against uh, Iowa and then limped off the field again. And once again, no Jackson's from the Jigba, but does that, you know, how much does that change what we've seen from the Ohio state offense all year? Nothing. Uh, and really it's just, Stuff they can't do with Jackson yet, but by this point, you know all of those Jackson plays. I think they're Emeka plays now. Mm-hmm. I think you've de- devised ways to um, incorporate Emeka Abuka. He's leading the team in receptions. He's I think he's second or third in the Big Ten in receptions. He's never going to catch Charlie Jones at Purdue because he's getting the ball like nine times a game. But they have, like I said earlier, the only time you realize that Jackson isn't out there is when he's trying to be out there. And that's not a slight on Jackson Smith and Jake, but 
that's how well everybody else is playing. And it's you got three guys who are scoring every single week, and Emeka and Marvin Harrison and Julian Fleming. All of these guys would be number one receivers anywhere else in the Big Ten. And they were um, two, three, and four coming into the season. Now they're all 1A, 1B, 1C, and you don't know necessarily which guy is going to blow up each week, and that's the perfect kind of wide receiver group to have. And whether Jackson Smith and Jigba is there or not, that doesn't change the fact that any one of these guys can go for 203 touchdowns in any game. Yeah, that that is a it makes you just so difficult to cover because you know you can you can if it's just Marvin Harrison and then two other guys yeah. who are just okay. You can throw a safety over Marvin Harrison all day, make him fight through two people, and you know he's so talented he probably puts up, <laughs> you know, five catches and seventy yards. But you really have to work for it, and it probably takes you twelve targets to get yeah. you that. You can do that, but then you've got Emeka Buka and you've got Julian Fleming, and both of those guys have had you know big plays, big big blow up games, big blow up plays. I mean, you and and for Penn State today. You've got two good corners. I mean, this is Penn State has two good wide receivers. They've got two good corners. They've got a good tight end. They've got a good safety. But you just you run into a numbers game where if Ohio State has three good wide receivers and you've only got two good corners, then you're gonna start running into a little bit of a problem there. Because okay, you can take away Marvin Harrison and you can take away Julian Fleming, but then well, Emeka Buka is then then Emeka Buka is the one who's having a big day. I also think players knowing what their roles are going to be and that Jackson is out allows them to play those roles better because it's not one of these things where things are changing during the game. Like last week, I wonder how much of that interception that, well, not the interception, but the, uh, the throw to Mecca Buka that could have been an interception. His role was being altered because Jackson was back involved. And so now you know that I'm going to be doing what I've been doing all season, essentially. And I know that job. I know, well, I don't have to worry about somebody else's job. I don't have to worry about moving. I can just do what I've been planning to do, game planning all week to do. That's the other thing. I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that Jackson was not practicing this week. We know he's getting looked at and, and evaluated. So these are guys that have been doing the same thing all week, knowing what they're doing, knowing the plan, and now they're just going to go execute it today at noon. And, you know, so that's one big name on defense, one big name on offense. There is a big name that's going to be missing on special teams. That's long snapper Bradley Robinson. And, you know, I mean, people may look and go, that's not a big name. Well, I, I can assure you within the program, Bradley Robinson is a very big name because Bradley Robinson is exactly what you need out of a long snapper and has been since I think the late Truman administration. Yeah. He is just consistent, reliable, always there, always perfect with the snaps. You see him. He's, he's also a, Really good athlete. You see him down yeah. the field as often as you see the gunners down the field. You see Bradley Robinson down the field downing punts inside the five. He's a really big part of some stuff that I think goes a little under the radar. So he's going to be out this week, and you know, presumably longer than that. We don't we don't have an official official prognosis on him yet. But he, when he went down last week, I thought mm, that probably is a not short term ish. Well, thing. up in the press box, you couldn't see who was down, but. By the way, Jesse Merkel was standing like in the vicinity and the concern that he showed, it sure felt like that seems like that's Bradley Robinson. Mm -hmm. And then eventually the guys move and you see that it is. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a big thing. He's one of your starters for multiple years. He's a guy that you don't have to worry about. Mm -hmm. And the special teams at Ohio State, if you go watch a practice, you'll see the special teams guys just off by themselves doing what they do. And, and it's almost like, uh, like those kids get recess. And while everybody else is supposed to be doing homework and it's like, why do those guys get recess? And it's, well, those are the specialists, <laughs> you know, that we don't bother with the specialists. Um, but now it's Mason Arnold who comes in and has to be as invisible as Bradley Robinson. If he can be invisible, you're doing your job. And he's done his job very well at Ohio state. And yeah, it's tough to see because this is his last year, presumably the seventh year, mm -hmm. you know, I, there are some scenarios where there, a, an eighth year could be perhaps put into play. But, um, you know, and, and Ryan Day said, I think on Tuesday, that he'd know more on Thursday, that sort of thing. But then it wasn't brought up again because the long snapper goes under the radar. The mm -hmm. special teams go under the radar quite a bit. And you you want to make sure they stay that way, basically. And that's how you know you're doing well. 
Yeah, and Mason Arnold is the guy who will be stepping in there, number 94 out of Tampa, Florida. He was a, a walk-on, and you know he is someone who probably, if you show you can do it at the end of this season – you know, and you're and you're going to be the guy next year. Maybe you do go on scholarship yeah. next year. So wearing Mike Vrabel's old number. I, what do you think Mike Vrabel thinks about having a long snapper oh, wearing his number? Um, Probably good things. Oh, I, I'm so sure. <laughs> I'm so sure. If you told him that, like like a press conference type of thing, like if you would have called into, like I'm sure like some teleconference that the NFL has, like Mike, uh, your thoughts, Ohio State, you know, starting a a long snapper who wears 94, and he'll be like. What did you, he just swallow his entire dip? Like, what did you just say to me? Like, I didn't do, I did not do this. And the real pro move here is that you're calling in and not asking us in person. Yes, That's the yes. real pro move here. Uh, just to run down the rest of the names on the availability report, who that are guys who are unavailable for today. Most of these are guys you've heard a bunch earlier this year. Defensive end Amari Abor, wide receiver Cameron Babb, wide receiver Caleb Burton. That's a new name this week, I believe, but. He's really – he just hasn't – has not seemed like he's gotten in the mix at any point this year. Uh, Walk-on running back, uh, T.C. Caffey, that's why you've got Chip Pranham moving from linebacker to running back. He's now the fourth running back this year. Uh, Corbin Cleveland, Blood McFarquhar, Mitchell Melton, Taraj Mitchell, Jalen Pace, Evan Pryor, Joe Royer, and Court Williams. Again, pretty much other than uh, Caleb Burton, those are all names we had kind of been hearing all all throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, fall on this availability yeah. report. So – you know, th- we've talked a little bit about the – we've talked a bunch about the Ohio State defense in the first half of the show. Started talking a little bit about the Ohio State offense here. But, you know, last week was not a great week for C.J. Stroud. He finished with, you know, 286 yards and four touchdowns, which is like, no, that's a great week. But you just – you watched it. It was like, well, for C- – by C.J. Stroud standards, this was not a good week. And it took a long touchdown to Jacks to uh, – um, Julian Fleming at the end to kind of bump those numbers up a little bit. How much of that do you attribute to Iowa stopping the run for Ohio State, getting pressure in C.J. Stroud's face, and how much do you think Ohio State's going to be able to run the ball and keep pressure out of C.J. Stroud's face today against Penn State? I definitely think pressure had something to do with that. I also am buying Ryan Day and Kevin Wilson saying the fields are too short. The field position was not what they had planned for, and it compresses the field and it makes defense the it gives basically an extra defender to Iowa by shortening the field because they have all of this stuff. Uh, and, and Alex and you know put on the board that expect Ohio State to throw the ball downfield, and it's like they wanted to, but there was no downfield to throw to. And you saw when they finally had some open fields, they were able to put some drives together, the deep one to Julian Fleming, but their first touchdown drive was like the first time they had an opportunity to go 75 yards. They did. And so I think, I think that just stunted them and it took a little while to, to come back from that, but also the pressure every time they did dial something up, you know, CJ wasn't able necessarily to step into stuff. The stopping of the run. I wonder how much that concerned the offensive line because they weren't playing their best and uh, you know how much, self-doubt or just questioning or just when you're not 100 confident you're not moving as well i think all of that but um i think if you if you give them longer fields i think they would have done better and they would have more opportunities to run the ball as well and maybe get that steam going i do expect the offensive line to be better this week particularly donovan jackson who everybody saw him make a mistake and give up a sack for, for a fumble and uh, i think ryan day or kevin wilson even said this week like justin fry called that that twist from the sideline saying, here it comes. I don't know if he didn't say it loud enough because the offensive line never heard him, but uh, you know, they were prepared for it. They talked about it all week and it happened. So Donovan Jackson and credit to him, he came out and talked this week on Wednesday. Yeah. And you know, he's really mature, really good player. Um, As Ryan Day said, I think on Thursday, he's going to be a star. And uh, this was one of those games where I bet he could not wait to get back on the field. And I bet he can't wait to get back out there today and prove not even just prove, just get that one out of, out of the you know the taste buds. Yeah, get get some new get some new film yes. out there. Yeah, and you wonder with a game where the the offensive line prides itself on being able to run the ball and protect the quarterback, yeah. and they did you know they didn't they didn't run the ball and they protected the quarterback okay, but not great last week. This feels like a week where this maybe is a little bit of a statement game for the Ohio. State. You know, if Ohio State comes out and really womps on Penn State's defensive front. 
that shows me something. If they come out and struggle again, that's kind of more of a concern then to me. Because Penn State, you know, gave up, what, 418 rushing yards to Michigan? Ohio State's, you know, offense is not Michigan's offense. Ohio State is going to throw the ball more than Michigan does. So Ohio State's not going to run for 400 yards. But if Ohio State doesn't run for 180 yards or 200 yards, or, you know, at least run for five and a half, six yards a carry, you know, if they're if they're down in the four and a half yard range and running for 120, 130 yards like that, that becomes a concern to me. I don't think you're going to see that. I think you're going to see that offense get back on track on the ground. Yeah, if they run for 120 yards, it's like, well, how how many of the available yards were they able to to capture, and how efficient were they? Because is that 25 for 120? Because they threw for 400 because they're you know, averaging like 16 yards an attempt from a bunch of big plays. Is it just a lack of opportunity? And lack of yards available for the running game that has like held them, but I'm thinking, uh, what is the baseline for a good day running the ball, an acceptable day running ball? Knowing that I just gave you a scenario where 125 yards would be good, yeah. Uh, but it's like I think I'm saying like 155 and a half, like below below 150, you feel like ah, you should have done more. You get to 160, you're like. I mean, it's still not great, but it's it's better. It's it's hundred more than last week. I guess what what does it is it the yards per carry? I think is the big tell and how many of those. Well, yeah, but that was just two carries of. You, know, you had two sixty yarders in there, and your other thirty carries were forty yards. That's mm-hmm. not good. Yeah, if you if you take out, I mean, we'll play the same game we played with the Penn State running backs yeah. earlier. You take out the longest run for Mayan Williams and the longest run for Trey Van Henderson, and. If they're still, you take that out and they're still running for five yards a carry. Oh, okay, that's a good, that's a good day. Cause that means you're probably averaging six, six and a half. And if you're at, you know, if you're at five and, and on average, that's okay. If you're at five and a half, that's solid. If you're at six, that's pretty good. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing like the Vince McMahon gift sequence, yeah. like, you know, <laughs> reacting. It's like, yeah, you know, six and a half, like really? seven's where he falls backwards out of his chair. That's, that's about the, where that sort of tops off. Anything more than that is like, wow, you're not going to be able to do this every week. But that that's a kind of what I think. And, you know, 30 carries, say 30 carries and 165 yards. That's like, if you see that, it's like, yeah, they were able to run the ball consistently enough that they kept running it. It was not, you know, 10 carries for 60 yards. It's 30 for 160, and that gets you, you know in the neighborhood of 5.3 probably that's like if, if you're in that range like that's that's fine then that pro- i'm not thrilled but i'm also not worried necessarily while ohio state has rushed for more than 200 yards in three of the last five games they've only broken the five yard per carry mark once and that was in 2017 39 carries for 201 an average carry of 5.15 hmm. yeah so penn state has not been easy to run on historically for ohio state but, you know, Ohio State keeps winning. Yeah. You know, the fact that they couldn't run on them last year, I think, is one of the big reasons why you saw field goals. And and that was the game that Ohio State was pretty much in control of and then kept kicking field goals. And so the margin was not – the difference in the scoreboard was not the difference on the field. I think another thing you're going to keep an eye on uh, today is, you know, Ohio State – how many touch – if they can't run it in, they're going to have to throw it in. Tale of Tape, Kevin Noon's fantastic column every week. He wrote about uh, the fact that Penn State, I'm just going to read it verbatim because I don't want to try it. I can't, no one could words better than Kevin. So do I'm it just going to do it with the hillbilly Southern accent. <laughs> I'm not sure Southern California really qualifies. It's South, but I'm not sure it really qualifies for the we hillbilly accent. <laughs> Should I do it with the Southern California? Uh, Dude. No team on Penn State's schedule has thrown for more than two scores in their games. Ohio State has thrown for no fewer than two passing touchdowns in any game. Two, Notre Dame and Rutgers. So both things could remain true. Penn State could hold Ohio State to two passing scores, and Ohio State could keep up its streak of at least two per game. But odds are on Ohio State's streak remaining intact, while Penn State's falls as the Buckeyes bring in the first truly balanced offense that Penn State has faced. Sorry, Michigan. Ooh. Nobody in Southern California has ever talked like that. Keanu Reeves is in Southern California. Shut up. No, you got to do like the, the SNL skit. The Southern Californians in the SNL skit. I, I wasn't going to do a Valley Girl. Like that was not going to happen. <laughs> but the um, the Ohio State offense, the, the red zone is going to be interesting to watch. They scored in the red zone every single time last week, but of course, four field goals. And I think 
if 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 the running game picks up, then I think you'll see the red red zone offense pick up. Those are two very related things. And uh, you know, the best thing is just don't go in the red zone. Just score from outside the red zone. Just shoot threes. <laughs> Not field goals. <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm sure if Ohio State can score a bunch of 40 yard touchdowns, they will choose to do that. That will I, try it. I don't. I don't think that's even necessarily an analytical thing. I don't think that's like a new. I think teams have been trying to score. <laughs> teams have been trying to score 40 yard touchdowns for a long time, Tony, and uh, I think they will continue to try that today. We have. Uh, we still have a long segment to wrap up with. Uh, we did our Hungry Hungry Huddle segment. We're going to wrap the show with that. But before we get to that, we do need to kind of do a, uh, you know, kind of an overall view of this game and what we're sort of expecting. I, I think to me, Ohio State's going to be able to run the ball well enough. They're not running at nine yards a carry and 418 yards like Michigan did, but they're able to run it well enough. I think you see at least one long run. I think you see, you know, Ohio State picking up. 12 first downs on the ground, 10, 12 first downs on the ground, another 15 maybe through the air, kind of controlling the ball, moving the chains. You For Penn State, when they've got the ball, can they keep that? Can they stay on schedule? Can they get to second and five instead of second and eight? Can they get to third and two instead of third and six? I don't know if they can't run the ball. And Clifford, Sean Clifford's got pressure in his face. I don't know if they're going to be able to stay on schedule like that. And if Penn State's not on schedule, Penn State's in a lot of trouble, I think. I, this Penn State offense and the big plays, say Penn State gets the, the five big plays that that Ohio State is allowing. And say, that what, what are, we, are those 25 yards? Are they 20 yards? Like, what, what are, is this? What, let's agree. 25 yards? Sure. What is the best way to distribute those for Penn State? Is it one, a drive? Is it two, a drive? And then you've got, well, that's two drives with 50 free yards and then a third with 25 yards. Or do you want to, like, piecemeal them out? Like, is, is one a drive better or is two a drive better? Um, one drive one a drive over five drives. One a, one a drive over five drives, I think. I think you'd space them out because you've got to, you know – Say you start every drive on the 25, right. you pick up one first down, then you get a 25 yarder. Now you're down at the Ohio State 40, and then you're kind of in scoring range already. And, you know, some of those drives you might be able to keep going with, yep. uh, you know, and, and pick up and pick up another first down or two and get a touchdown. Sometimes it might be, you know, you, you pick up seven more yards, you're kicking a long field goal. I think you do that because there's there's a way you spend – two long plays on one drive. You go from the 25 to the 50 and then you go from the 50 to the 25 and you're still kicking a field goal. So I think you want to space those out. Now, what will James Franklin decide? How will... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is not, this is not a, this is not a, uh, I'll take coach. them all right now on one drive. <laughs> this is yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> don't, don't spend them like that. That's no, no, how, no, no, no. That's how the offense ends up in the parking lot. Yeah. That's, 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 <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, that's not how you actually get to uh, he's, decide. He's like hitting on 22. <laughs> Hit me. Hit me. It'll, it'll, uh, I, I think Penn State is going to have enough offense to keep this game interesting mm-hmm. into the second half. But I don't think there's going to be a point in the fourth quarter where, I mean, unless Ohio State's kicking a bunch of field goals, yeah. if Ohio State's averaging, what, five points per red zone trip, something like that, where you're, you're just as many touchdowns as field goals, essentially. They're probably ahead two scores in the fourth quarter, and like you're not really to sw- type of thing. something like that. That's that's about right. And if it's a little better than that, if you you know you turn just one more of those, and all of a sudden, well, now it's thirty four seventeen. You turn two more into touchdowns, it's thirty eight seventeen, and it just it doesn't take much to get from Ohio State wins, kind of close ish but comfortable, to Ohio State wins by three touchdowns. This it just it just feels like historically in this series, there's just been a lot of 30 to 17, you know, not exactly that score, but that yeah. type of game where it's like, wow, boy, last year was like that. If if they just you know scored a couple more touchdowns instead of kicking field goals, Ohio State controls the whole game, but it was close ish late. You know, 31 17 versus 38 17. It you know, functionally it's functionally it's the same result, but it just feels so much different to have that one extra score. I wonder what the this is probably this is a very good question for this is a good question for Ryan Day. 
do you go into a game with what we're just talking about? I think we're going to hold them to 17. And so that's how you plan what you're going to do. I will kick field goals because, um, you know, an empty possession, uh, three points is better than an empty possession going forward on fourth and not getting it. And I know I will score touchdowns. So I'm okay with 50% touchdown completion percentage in the red zone. I'm okay with three field goals and three touchdowns because that's 30 points. And I think that's going to be enough. So if I have to get those three field goals in the first quarter, in the first half, I'm okay with that. Eventually the touchdowns will come. That's the mentality you take into an Iowa game. Is that the same mentality you take into a Penn State game on the road where an empty possession is momentum? A field goal is less momentum mm-hmm. for the Penn State fans and the Penn State crowd. So do you have the same mentality as last week? I think you have to look at the Penn State Michigan game where Penn State got completely dominated. At one point late in the first half, might have been even halftime, Michigan had 18 first downs and Penn State had one. And the score was Michigan 16, Penn State 14. You can't do that. I mean, that that's that's the 2019 Fiesta Bowl model. Like it worked out fine for Michigan. It did not work out fine for Ohio State in 2019 Fiesta Bowl, where they completely dominated the first half, kept kicking field goals, and you know, you had drop passes in the red zone and all that stuff. It was not that was not just like Ryan Day saying, No, we in fact we are going to not call anything. We're just gonna run the ball and center it for field goal in the first half. That was that was not it. They just didn't execute a couple times, kept kicking field goals, and it was this exact same score, 16-14, because you, you had the play where Sean uh, Wade gets heaved for targeting, and you know. Clemson is completely outplayed and then go into the locker room down yeah. two points. And it was just kind of like, Oh boy, that's not good for Ohio state. I think you have to learn from that kind of lesson where, you know, we, how often do we talk about, you know, against an offense like Ohio state getting off the field with a field goal is a win. Yeah. So don't voluntarily give them a win. If it's fourth and eight, okay. Kick your field goal. If it's fourth and two, I don't think you're going to see Ryan Day kicking field goals on fourth and two because this is a Penn State offense that's good enough that, that you know, this is not Iowa. They're, you know, you're not going to hold Penn State's offense to three points probably during the course of the game. So you're going to have to get to the mid to high, I mean, mid to high 20s at the absolute right. bare minimum to win this game. And you probably need to get into the 30s to win it comfortably. Do you know how many field goals it takes to get you into the 30s, Tony? So is it three? Four. Five. Do you see what I have to deal with here, folks? It's four. Four? (laughs) Yes, yes, Tony, it's four. Yes. Why don't you go tend the rabbits? All right. Uh, (laughs) It is, it is, uh, this is a game where Ohio State's going to need some sevens. You got, you have, you have to get some sevens. And, you know, obviously they're going into every drive with the intention of getting seven. But I think that also changes your mentality in terms of play calling, where if you're going in saying, like, well, three would be an acceptable outcome here, you might call plays differently on first and second down, if you know you're going to – odds are you're going for it on fourth down, you can call your third and sixth play, and that can be a run play to get you to fourth and three, and then you can run for on fourth and Play three. calling is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm-hmm. And it's the, the thing where – and over time, the bottom of the inning, all we need is a field – we need a field goal to tie. So let's just make sure we don't screw up the field goal, and let's just run plays to make sure we end up with that field goal because you don't want to throw an interception in the end zone. And it's – surprise, now you're kicking a 46-yard field goal because you you know, you know didn't move the ball at all. And it's like, crap, we've got a college <laughs> kicker. It's like, if, if only you knew. If only you knew, yes. But, I mean, what are the odds that an overtime game goes long in Beaver Stadium? I mean, can, <sighs> can you think of a single example of a game where teams are struggling offensively and – no, I, me neither. And, and, right. and kicks don't get blocked there either. No. Anyway, so so uh, sorry guys, I, I I don't know why Kevin felt he needed to share that. That's in, completely inappropriate. And he's wearing a blue shirt. <laughs> as far as maybe I don't know. Uh, it is it is time, Tony. Oh, I, all right. To do score predictions, we need to uh, need to uh, get on get on uh, the road to Happy Valley at some point. So we're going to do that relatively soon. We're gonna let Kevin redeem himself first. Kevin, you can you can share your score prediction. We, we don't know his score prediction. I yet. know. I'm very excited. So, Kevin, what are you uh, what are you expecting today? Yeah, I I see this kind of going the same path that Iowa did in terms of it's going to be a close game for the first half, but uh, talent is talent, and Ohio State's a much deeper team. And once it's all said and done, 
actually on Buckeye Huddle it says 4220. Uh, I really meant to say 4221. I think Ohio State's going to be able to pull away late, cover, and have its biggest victory ever in Happy Valley. A 21 point victory for the Buckeyes, according to Kevin Noon. 4221. That is ridiculous. Absurd. 21 points. As he said, never. 20, 20 points in 2007, I believe, was the biggest margin of victory for Ohio State in Happy Valley. <laughs> Tony, Kevin is obviously an amateur. Correct. Something of an imbecile. 21 point win. So, Ke- Tony, what did you pick, Ohio State? Uh, I went 38 17, Ohio State. All along, when you think about these games, for me, I get numbers that flash in my head in terms of what what a team is going to score. And the the, the brightest number out of this entire week was 17. And it's like, okay, that must be Penn State's number. And then you, you, you then you go off of that one, and then it's like 38. It's like, oh, that must be Ohio State's number because Penn State's number already came to me. And I thought, you know what, 38-17 feels like it's a situation where the offense, Ohio State's offense, will eventually score. And I feel like 31 is low. 38 is too high to say it's low, but it might be low. And I'm right there with you. I like the fact that you basically were picking games off of a Ouija board this week. The way you're, the way you're describing it just comes it. to me. It's uh, yes, Madam Madam Gerderman with his with her. her I didn't mean to misgender you. Uh, you. Yes, the uh, it's the Power. it's the it's it's the 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 head scarf and the yeah. The um, uh, incense. That's what. Continue that's what really to offend me, Tom. See how it works out for you. That's twenty-one points, isn't it? Yes, it is twenty-one points, Kevin. Th- thank you for thank you for explaining that. Yes, that's the joke. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway. So I have uh, I have uh, a, of course Tony and I do these prediction shows every week and uh, on the Buckeye Weekly podcast feed. And every week we pick these scores completely independently, and every week we're like two points off. This week, very different from that. Tony, we picked the exact same score. I also had Ohio State 38, Penn State 17. So Makes uh, sense. It's a sensible score. Yeah, no, I, you're not going to pick them to win by 21 points. I, just three touchdowns, three PATs. That's I it. think that's it. That's reasonable. I, I think you just have to, you have to understand history, understand the situation. Yeah. You, you have and, and not pick a ridiculous scoring margin. Nope. Oh. So – I'm I'm right there with you. I I look at this and it's like I don't think Penn State's gonna be able to consistently move the ball against the Ohio State defense. They they were are gonna hit some big. They will hit a couple big plays. They capitalize on those. You get a couple touchdowns. Okay, kick another field goal at some point. Seventeen. Bing bang boom. You're done. And you know maybe they'd be had to pick six and then it's twenty four or pay scoop and score or whatever it is. But it feels like the offense is gonna get seventeen points on the board. And Ohio State is just. If Penn State's not moving the ball consistently, Ohio State's going to have more opportunities, probably have some decent field position. Yeah. You cash that in uh, a few more times. and Decent know, field position is bad. Well, no, incredible <laughs> field position is bad. We established this last week. But, you know, 21 to 10 at halftime, and then, you know, and then it's 20, you know, 31, 17 at the end of the third quarter. You tack on one more in the fourth, and it's 38, 17, something like that. It just you bring in Kyle McCord to throw deep to Julian Fleming, who pitches to Marvin Harrison, and you have an all PA touchdown celebration. All PI defense, all PA PA offense. It's I like it. Yeah, I, I, I do think that's I do think that's you know, I you know this is either a tremendous amount of groupthink or uh we really have this one pegged, one or the other. Which one will history say? <laughs> I'm excited to find out. Uh, I'm also – so that that is going to wrap the uh, sort of pregame segment of this. We did, however, on Friday night when we go on the road, we do a segment we like to call Hungry Hunger Huddle. Go try a different local place so we're not going to just hit like some national chain. On uh, Friday night, we went to a place called Hosses, which I was very excited to go to. Had never been before and had seen billboards for, yep. for a million years. So – uh, we, uh, you can get a, uh, get to uh, show you that in just a minute, but uh, before we get to that, I do want to remind you, we will have our usual post game show here, youtube.com slash Buckeye huddle right after the game. As soon as that clock hits zero, Devin Radcliffe and Mark Givler will be, uh, covering the uh, sort of instant reaction piece 
all the interviews, interviews with players and coaches. Tony and I will have the uh, usual instant reaction Buckeye Weekly episode following all of that. Usually a good solid two, two and a half hours of uh, live post-game content. Should be a lot to talk about one way or the other after this game. One way or the other, you said it. So uh, thank you guys all for joining us this morning. We will see you after the game. And now please enjoy the uh, most recent edition of Hungry Hungry Huddle. Uh, can we get the flat iron steak with the uh, salad? Okay, flat iron steak. How well done do you want it? <laughs> How well done do you want it? 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 All right, it is another Ohio State road game week. We are in central Pennsylvania for the Ohio State-Penn State game. And this is a Hungry Hooker Huddle episode that I am legitimately excited for. And I will tell you why, and it's kind of a stupid reason. I grew up on the East Coast, had relatives in Ohio, went to college in Ohio, still have relatives in the East Coast. So I have driven back and forth across Pennsylvania conservatively 120 times and probably significantly more than that over the last 30, 40 years. And... I will tell you that I have seen billboards for Hoss's Steak and Seafood on every single one of those trips, and not just one. This is like the wall drug of Pennsylvania, where you just see a million billboards in this place. So hundreds, if not thousands of times, I've seen Hoss's Steak and Seafood food billboards. And Tony, I finally get to go eat there. Well, I'm happy for you. And yes, this is one that we've heard about from both Kevin Noon, Steve Hellwagon on their many trips. It's always, every, every time you pass a Hoss, Hoss's, it's like, you know, the old people that read the signs as you're traveling. It's kind of like that. And so anytime you can go to a steak and seafood place with a uh, salad bar that people talk about and all of these different things. And the way I've continued to hear it uh, described or I've described it and had that confirmed would be like, like a fancier Ponderosa, a fancier, you know, things that we don't really have anymore. But you've got it here. And so it reminds me of stuff I grew up with. Um, just from the outside looking in, and a uh, family type of atmosphere from what I've heard, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, can we get the flat iron steak with uh, the salad? Okay, flat iron steak, how well done do you want it? 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 Uh, let's go medium. medium. With salad bar. Yes. And your one side. Let's go mashed potatoes, please. You want gravy on it? Yeah. I remember you did a restaurant. Hi, can I get a Cajun ribeye, medium rare? And I'll do the salad bar and sweet potato, please. Oh, they were. That was their supper. Base for any salad. A little bit of lettuce. You, you're the reason there's a sneeze bar. <laughs> um, and then we look down here for toppings, which are further down. Although we will have some potato salad. Trim a little. Get some macaroni salad. We don't want to mix the two. It's not very big. The fun part about coming to a salad bar is it's like, Tony's like, oh, what's that? It's like, no, those are carrots. That's, that's broccoli. That's, that's lettuce. You're not going to spoil your appetite, are you? No, there's just not a very big salad. It's a small plate. Small plate. What are you, one of these hippies? Some tomatoes, those of onions. Course. There's some no. tomatoes on there. I know you love the tomatoes, but Kevin. No, 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 you. no, no, not really. Good job, get in there. Good job. And what kind of dressing are we going to go with? Italian? No, I guess we'll do a little bit of a little uh, ranch. A little ranch. Your, not too much. You're a real American. That's what cowboys eat. That's what cowboys eat on their salad because they're on ranches too. Tony's a big boy. <laughs> and of course, gotta get the bacon. Gotta get the bacon. I think this is so much pressure. Tony already grabbed cookies. He hasn't had his meal yet, and he grabbed chocolate chip cookies. We can't take him anywhere. No, you, you truly cannot. And, and that's and at this point, that's on us for not realizing that. I got myself a, uh, an eight ounce flat iron steak with some mashed potatoes and gravy. Got some garlic butter on that steak. 
Kevin, to make sure we got the ketchup, so that's fantastic. Thank you for that, Kevin. Make sure to get that in the shot, as always. Medium, just regular medium, as you saw. Tom? I got uh, the ribeye and got it uh, Cajun style, got it with a sweet potato. Little, uh, I don't know, au jus, I guess, apparently. So, thank you. That is, uh, au jus is French for the jus, which uh, is very, it's a very important part of a steak. Um, but yeah, looking looking forward to this. Um, I, Tony did not disgrace himself as much as I was expecting, so. Well, the night is still young. And uh, Kevin, what did you get? Well, let me just make sure I'm in focus here. I got a Cajun ribeye with rice pilaf. I had a large order of uh, waffle fries from Chick-fil-A earlier, so I was kind of potatoed out. So I'm looking forward to this, but not as much as I'm looking forward to just watching Tony enjoy his steak. We're finally on a on a hungry, hungry huddle somewhere that he doesn't order a barbecue bacon burger or, or nuggies or anything like that. I'm just gonna, I eat uh, all my foods like one at a time, so it's gonna be mashed potatoes for the next 10 minutes. Just so you're aware. Very slowly. We'll, 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 we'll come back later. No, 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 no. We'll do this. First, gotta get, get rid of some of that butter. Just because. And uh, let's see. What's the, where's the best place to go at this? Let's go ahead. Knives. How do they work? Looks like your first time around a steak. Well, you just tried to find, I'm just trying to find a good spot. A sweet spot? Yeah. So hopefully this is it. See, it's a little too pink for me. It's a lot too pink for me, but I'm going to try to be, I'm going to try to be strong. And here we go. A little too juicy? It's a joke. It's a joke. Is it though? No, it's very good. Very good. I'm enjoying it. All right, I mean, it's... Uh, Tony accidentally got a steak the way you're supposed to order a steak, which is good. This is exciting. This is this is like when you get your kids to try a vegetable for the first time, and they're like, oh, that's not bad. It turns out that's not bad. It turns out that, you know, cucumbers are not, in fact, going to kill me. So but that's, that's uh, you know, this is maybe this is a chance for Tony to learn and grow as a person and learn to eat steak like your grown-up. Maybe, maybe. I don't know that that's true. A lot of times that's why I'll, a lot of times. The three times in the last 15 years I've had steak, I'll get a medium well just because it might end up like this. So that's what I, I guard against. Yes, wait. but it's, it's smart. You got to protect yourself from a properly cooked steak. That's nothing, nothing more dangerous than that's, that's, that's an opinion. Well, Tom and Kevin, a full meal had by all. I, I enjoyed it. It was, as I said, less done than I normally have, but it worked out fine. I'm okay. Everybody made it, and so I enjoyed it. Good mashed potatoes, had a salad bar, a nacho bar. Uh, just finished some ice cream with some chocolate chips, some hot fudge. Are you taking the ketchup home with you? Shut up, man. <laughs> you know how you leave a bar and you take the pint glass? It's kind of like that. I'm not entirely sure Tony realizes he's being video recorded right now, but that's okay. The, the, the highlight of the night for me was the moment where the ice cream machine was out of ice cream and Tony was told that the ice cream machine was out of ice cream. And it was however disappointed you've ever seen a person look. It was like that. It was, you know, it was like you're, you're the uh, alternate astronaut and you find out you're not going to space. That was Tony's, the look on Tony's face when it was like they're out of, out of ice cream. But then Tony... What's his name got the measles, and you got to go on Apollo 13. So, congratulations, bud. But what happened when the ice cream machine was uh, filled back up? Who got up very quickly? Uh, it was, it was, you know, we talk about Tyleek Williams being fast off the ball, and Mike Williams being fast, Mike Hall being fast off the ball. That was Tony Gerdeman when it was just like, wait a minute, there's... You were right there. You were up just as quickly, and then I, Kevin was too, and this entire was, table, and there was like six people waiting while we were walking up there. So, Sir, I did not have any ice cream. And who was first online there when we, were, when we got I'm there? I'm closest. Uh-huh. Anyway, so, Tony Gerdeman, the Mike Hall of soft serve. Well, okay. I, I would I would agree with that. But overall, I, I enjoyed my meal. You, Tom? Yeah, it was. This reminded me very much of uh, like a, a nicer version of Ponderosa. If you remember Ponderosa, I don't think those are around anymore. But I used to love those as a kid. 
and uh, right down to the ice cream bar. Yeah. Fun, a uh, little nostalgic, and uh, definitely, uh, definitely an enjoyable. You know, not, not the not the fanciest restaurant in the world, but you know, good, a good solid meal. Very quaint. Yeah. Very yeah. friendly staff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Uh-huh. <laughs>